Good morning. Welcome to worship with us this morning and our chance to uh, get together and sing and pray and, and uh, praise God. If you're visiting with us today or if you're not, please get one of the folders on that side of the auditorium. Someday I'm going to learn what direction that is. But on your left side of the pew, there is a folder. If you fill that out and send it across, uh, we try to keep track of where everybody is. And if you're visiting with us, I'd like to send you a text, maybe a phone call. You never know if I might visit sometime, but I promise I won't come looking for your money. But I would love to let you know I appreciate you coming and worshiping with us. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to give a little plug for 1.30 and 2 o'clock this afternoon. We'll be singing here at 1.30 in the afternoon. The air conditioner will be on and we'll be comfortable here while you're sweltering at home uh, without your air conditioner or, you know, that terrible heat. I'm sure you all have very comfortable homes. But we're going to sing together at 1.30 and at 2 o'clock... We will talk about the miracle, and the title of our lesson is, Thank You, Go Away. And so I think you'll enjoy that, that miracle, and you'll have the chance to discuss it and figure out just what miracle I'm talking about. But right now, I'm ready to praise God. How about you? Would you stand with me, and let's open our mouths and hearts in praise to God. <clears throat> I am the vine, and ye are the branches, bear precious fruit for Jesus today. Branches in Him, no fruit ever buried, Jesus has said. Lord, let my feet 
bow with me in prayer. Our God in heaven, as we approach your throne this morning, we give thanks to you for all the many blessings that you have given us, that you have blessed us with this day. We thank you so much for the ability that we have to worship you in, free, in the freedom that we enjoy in this country today. Please be with each of us. Open our hearts to the message that Chris will bring. Bless Chris and help him in his deliverance. Thank you so much for the elders that we have. I ask that you bless each of them with wisdom and guide their thoughts each day. Be with our deacons as they work to make this congregation a wonderful place to worship and to, and to be involved in. But thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I'll be reading from Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 in the New King James Version. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways passing, finding out for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him and shall be repaid to him, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. As was just read in that scripture, the depth and the riches and the goodness of God. As we so shall sing this next song as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. For the depth and the riches of God's saving grace flowing down from the cross for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time, this moment that we have come to. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to overcome all of the things we had to overcome to get here. We thank you, Lord, for all of the blessings which have made it possible for us to be here. We thank you for this remembrance, for these gifts, for this time to cross through space and time, through memory, to sit at the table with our brothers, with Jesus, to hear him say to us after giving thanks for the bread, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we 
partake of it. Strengthen us, strengthen our courage to remember that it is not just a receiving, but a participation in Jesus and in all that he is doing in the world. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here, to partake of this cup, the new covenant, Lord, in Jesus' blood. We thank you for the remembrance of it. Help us, Lord, to remember that it is a covenant and that we have our part to play in that. Help us, Lord, to do so now and each day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Freely we have received, let us now freely give. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. We know, Lord, that all that we have and all that we are comes from you. We ask you to help us each day and each moment to cultivate in ourselves a spirit and a heart that is giving. Help us to not be attached to things, but to make sure that blessings flow through us, Lord from you to all those with whom we come in contact. As we give now, please bless those who will have charge of it in order that it may go and do what you would have it to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm satisfied with just a cup of free love, a little silver, and a little gold. But in that city, where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that's silver. Not 
not 801. He was at his desk with his cup of coffee, ready to begin work at 8 a.m. sharp every day until his alarm clock did not go off. And he overslept by 15 minutes, and that was destroying his whole routine. And so he rushed around, he got, his, he got shaved as quickly as he could, nicked himself once or twice, got his clothes on as fast as he could, and started running down to catch the ferry. He had to catch the ferry, but he had worked so quickly that he was going to make that ferry. And so he was running to get there, and he turned around the corner, and there was the ferry, and it was seven feet from the dock. And with a great leap, he leaped aboard and he made it and collapsed on the deck in a heap. And the stevedore said, I don't know why you didn't just wait till we tied up. <laughs> he gave you enough time, they were on the way in, not on the way out. You know, sometimes we, we make up a crisis for ourselves. We imagine all kinds of trouble and I must have been 30 before my mother finally taught me, never trouble, trouble, till trouble troubles you. That's why it stuck with me so well, because I was troubling trouble. And sometimes we are so anxious about things we cannot control that we give up controlling the things that we can. What are those things which contains these last three doctrinal chapters of the book of Romans. It will surprise you perhaps that while we will go on through chapter 16 of Romans, when we complete talking about chapter 11 of Romans today, we will have completed the doctrinal portion of that book, the, the great concept of faith in Christ Jesus. But to complete that concept of faith in Christ Jesus... Paul needs to answer the question between Jew and Gentile. Why did God reject the Jews when they are his chosen people? How can God make them the eternal promise, you will always be my chosen people, and somehow reject them? And the answer comes with three main points. One message for the moment, one thing to learn, and one thing to learn as those of us who have read the whole book. The whole book comes down to one major point here in this chapter. So, three things, and I think these three things are very valuable, but first let's go back to a, let's go back to a, a point that needs to be made. The religious world today has, by and large, Evangelical Protestants have become premillennial. They are looking forward to a thousand year literal reign of Christ here on this earth. They extrapolate from one very symbolic passage, Revelation chapter 20, to make that thousand year reign. A lot of this work was done by a man named William Miller, who in the 1840s predicted the return of Jesus Christ in March of 1844, and when he did not return as he expected, he declared that it would happen in October of 1844, and then William Miller refused to make any such pronouncements or predictions ever again, and disputed his own theories. But the theory that the earth is 4,000 years old, and therefore... Seven days a week, a thousand years is a day, and the seven thousandth year of Earth's existence will be a Sabbath millennial kingdom is an idea that permeates much of Christianity. When, in fact, the Apostle Peter, when he started the church, not by himself, but Jesus gave him those keys in the kingdom, and the first time those keys were used are in Acts chapter 2, when the first gospel sermon was preached, and he quoted Joel chapter 2, in the last days, saith the Lord, and he said, this is that, which was predicted by the, by the, by the prophet Joel. So Peter himself says, we are in the last days. And there is truly a second coming of Christ Jesus to come. We look forward to that. But a lot of the speculation 
that somehow or another this has to happen and that has to happen and, and there will be those who take all the current events of the world and they have been twisting it around to say that means Jesus is almost here. He's about to come. That was World War I. Jehovah's Witnesses pointed that Jesus came in 1914. And we missed it. But I, 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 I know I, I have a sarcastic bent to what I'm trying to say and I love many good, fine people who are dedicated to Jehovah's Witnesses, but I think they're in error about this. Um, everyone thought, well, before that, the Crimean War was going to bring about the end of the world. World War I was going to bring about the end of the world. <clears throat> Certainly World War II, and Hitler had to be the great Satan, had to, had to, those things, and certainly God is involved in this world. But Jesus didn't know the day or the hour of his return in Matthew chapter 24. And why do we expect to know that? And this chapter has sometimes been construed to say that there will be, before the thousand year reign of Christ, a great incoming of Jews. And the Jewish nation will be restored and Jesus will rule over them and all the world in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Because of the statement in this chapter, and all Israel will shall be saved, verse 26. Verse 25. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. It will not bother me one bit if before the coming of my Lord Jesus Christ, multitudes of Jews come to Christ. Praise God, that would be wonderful. And perhaps Paul is suggesting that day may come once all the rest of the world has been evangelized at a time of all the Gentiles, of most Christians being Gentiles, if that time changes... And all the Jews come in, that doesn't bother me a bit. I don't think it fits in that necessarily all the rest of the idea of the rapture, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and many other concepts are there. We, we need some classes on eschatology, amen? We need to know about those last things because there is such confusion. But what I'm interested in this chapter today is that while they were concerned that Israel had not been saved, and it was bothersome and they had division between Jew and Gentile and this whole book is bring coming together in the book of, in the city of Rome this church needs to be unified whether these folks are Jews or Gentiles and no one needed to have pride about that and some were frustrated and upset that their brethren they found their fellow Jews were not being baptized in Christ Jesus and were opposed to the to the kingdom of Christ today I'm frustrated too. How about you? Some of the people I love have not obeyed the gospel. Some of the people I have shared the gospel with have rejected it. And sometimes I feel they've rejected me. And try as I might, I, I sometimes become discouraged and start thinking, well, the whole world is a bad field. Nobody's going to listen to me. No, nobody's interested. They just keep rejecting me over and over and over again. And I go to knock on the door and say, as one fellow did who didn't want to be there, and he was forced to be there because of his educational obligations, and he held the, his Bible up when the door was answered and said, You don't want to study the Bible, do you? Well, his young friend who was assigned to him said, You know what? I'll, I will take that next door. I wanted you to take this one. I'll take the next one. And Harry Potter, that was his name, became a great evangelist for Jesus Christ, even though his first partner uh, did not use the best of technique. But whenever I look at the story, stony soil, and I have fellow Christians who spring up and then they don't have any depth in them. Then I have others who seem to be led astray by all the cares of this world in the thorny soil. As Jesus described in Matthew 13. And then there's that wayside soil. And I keep running into that, folks, who don't even listen in the first place. 
The devil snatches the word right out of their hearts. I forget that we're looking for the good soil. And it's out there. So as we're frustrated and we're, as we're dealing with some of the harder soils, and Paul is here talking about some harder soil, don't give up. While there is life, there is hope. You never, never know what will happen. And while time permits, let's keep talking to everyone we can about Jesus Christ and not get frustrated about the few who don't listen. Actually, the many who don't listen. Three lessons. Three, three main messages I find in this chapter. In chapter 11, in verses 3 and 4. We could begin in verse 1. I say that has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. For do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life? But what does, divine what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Whenever we're discouraged, when we're upset, when we're ready to just give up, and we've forgotten Mount Carmel. This is, seems to be the day or two after Mount Carmel, when Elijah has won the great victory over the prophets of Baal. But he's afraid all this hard work has gone for nothing because Jezebel's trying to take his life. He says, I've got 7,000. 7,000 men. There was probably more than a million in the population of the northern kingdom. So that's 0.7%. But God's still got his remnant. God's still got his people. Elijah was still having his effect. God's word was still working. And even if your job is to keep on preaching who will not listen to you and you think you're not doing any good and it's not working, God's word always does its job. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah is the prophet who answered in, in Isaiah chapter 6, Here am I, send me. And he found out the job was you go preaching to people who won't listen to you. You keep on preaching and you keep preaching until the land is destroyed. But God says in Isaiah chapter 55 that it's going to work. So shall be the word that goes forth from my mouth, verse 11. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word always works. It's never us. It's the word. As we think about the best way to approach somebody and to talk to somebody about Christ, what's the best way to give that invitation? Just say something. When were we growing the most as Churches of Christ in America? Well, I got, kind of got a picture of it the other day at the preacher's luncheon when uh, the oldest of us said, uh, you know, uh, I've been telling people they're in the wrong church. And if you're not in the right church, you're going to hell. Well, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It also says there is one body, even as we're called in one hope, they're calling. Jesus is going to save his church. We better be members of it. Now, I've been in some buildings that said Church of Christ on them that I don't think they were Church of Christ. It's pretty sad. Changes may have taken place from doctrine, and some other folks had the most unchristian attitudes and had put a sign on the door. And so I'm going to do what they said, but I may not do what some of those folks did, like Jesus said of the Pharisees of the first century. But I. Better say something. It cringe whenever somebody is unkind. I hate that. But a silent mouth.
does absolutely nothing for the Lord when his word needs to be spoken. We've got to get out there and talk to people about Jesus and love them enough to say so. And guess what? There may only be 7,000, but it's going to work. There were five, four different kinds of soil, and there was good soil. And we're so concerned. It reminds me of John chapter 4, Jesus and the, uh, the woman at the well. Jesus had this conversation with the woman at the well while the disciples were off buying food in Sychar in Samaria. And she leaves while they come. And Jesus was hungry, sent them for food, and whenever they come back, Jesus doesn't eat the food they went for. They're wondering what's wrong with Jesus. And he says, I've got food to eat that you don't know anything about. Say not that there are four months into the harvest. Lift up your eyes, for the fields are white unto harvest. Jesus saw the good soil, and he started the evangelism with that one woman. She went into Sychar, the least likely person to spread the gospel you can imagine. She's had, how many husbands did Jesus say five? And the man you're living with is not your husband. She's not exactly the person you would ask to go spread the message. But she's the one who says, come and see the one who told me everything I've ever done. Well, that's an exaggeration. But he knew stuff he couldn't know. Could this be the one? And she had the whole town coming out to him. You don't know who the next woman at the well is going to be. You have to talk to everybody. Are they living an immoral lifestyle? Probably. Are they talking like a sailor instead of a Christian? Probably. Are they even maybe dishonest on the job or breaking the law? Maybe. That doesn't mean they can't hear the gospel. And the gospel can't have its effect on their life. And who knows who they know? Who knows where the gospel will go next? My word will not return to me void. There are still 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal. Even though the prophet's life was at risk. Jesus told, to go, told us to go into the, all the world and make them all disciples, right? How have I misquoted Matthew chapter 28 verse 19? Go ye into all the world... And make all the world disciples. Is that what Jesus said? He didn't expect everybody to respond. He said to make disciples of all the nations. Some of them will respond. You need to make disciples from any kind of folks we come across. And realizing it may just be the 7,000. Not the million. Verse 23. The Apostle Paul writes, beginning verse 22, Therefore the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in it, his goodness, otherwise you'll be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Paul is using the figure of an olive tree here and says that the Jews are the, the olive tree, but they have rebelled against God and they've been cut off and Gentiles have been grafted in. It's backwards. In fact, Paul describes the fact that it's backwards. You take domesticated limbs and put them in a strong wild tree. That's the way apples tree. Apple trees uh, throughout, as far as I know, it's still this way. Every tree in an orchard is a crab apple tree. But the branches from a golden delicious or branches from a pink lady tree, those are, are grafted into the wild tree. Because the wild tree is great. Root, roses are like that. You never let the root, roots of your roses grow up with their own shoots because they'll all be wild roses. The wild rose is hardy and the 
beautiful varieties are more fragile. And so we graft them in to the strong root. Well, we've been grafted in, we Gentiles. But while there's life, while they have not yet gone on to, into eternity, every Jew could respond to the gospel and become obedient instead of disobedient. They've been rejected. They've rejected Christ. Christ hadn't rejected them. And they were still rejecting the gospel. It wasn't that Paul was rejecting them. He, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, describes, I become all things to all men that I might be able to gain some. To, be, to the Jews, he became as a Jew. He was a Jew. In fact, he says, they're not cut off completely. I mean, they, they not like they can't come back in or else... I am a Benjamite. I'm an Israelite. I couldn't be a Christian if all of the Jews have been rejected. And you know somebody. And you've tried. And you've tried. And you've tried. And maybe it's time to start talking to some other folks too. But never give up. Keep praying. Keep talking. Keep sharing. Because sometimes we just give up. And we give up on ourselves. And we give up on God. We stop living the kind of life in front of those others that we ought to live. And we just give up. It's not going to work. Maybe it won't. Because they have a choice. It is whosoever will, not, who's, not all must. And all must. But no one's going to be compelled to obey the gospel. No one's going to be forced. I mean, people try that. That's what crusades are all about. But that's not biblical. That's not what we do. But don't give up on that mate, on that child, on that family member, on that co-worker, on that friend. Keep praying. Keep inviting. And stay a friend. Maintain the relationship the best you can. And go on to somebody else. But don't give up on that person. Keep praying. Keep talking. Because you just don't know. My mother-in-law was a sweet woman, uh, Beulah Russell. And her brother threw her in a pond to teach her to swim. She was about four years old. She never forgot that experience. And she would not go to the Church of Christ because they baptized people. And she was so deathly afraid of water, she couldn't do it. And her husband died. And the principal from the school and their friends were all members of the Church of Christ. They brought food. They took care of them. They, they handled the funeral. I don't know what help they received. But they loved on her. And whenever her daughter grew up and went to high school, there was this crazy boy who dated her and said, I'll date you, but we're going to church together. And sure enough, she obeyed the gospel, and her other daughter obeyed the gospel. She heard sermon after sermon, and finally, we got four strong men to hold her down and help her become a Christian. You don't know. You just don't know. She never forgot the Sunday that a drug user, reformed I hope by that time, came into church. This boy had done some time because in addition to his drugs, he'd been drinking and driving a great big Cadillac as fast as he could down a dyke road in, in that community and slammed into them head on. And that man came to church. And that man obeyed the gospel. And she had to forgive him. And she did. You don't know. You just don't know who the next person who's going to obey the gospel is. Do you think Paul at Saul of Tarsus was a good prospect while he's looking for people to kill for Jesus? And that's who Jesus had his last personal appearance to a sinner with. 
until he comes again and sinners won't want to see. You don't know. While there's life, there's hope. Lesson number three. I've been doing a really bad job. I'm excited about our lesson today. Remember, failure is just apparent. There may be 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee. We've already covered it also. That was, that, was, that was number one there. Apparent. That's the word you want. Number two, where there's life, there's hope. Did you get all that written down? I gave it all to you, so there's no, nothing underlined. Third, verses 19 through 21. You say then, Gentiles are saying, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear, for God did not spare the natural branches. He may not spare you either. Verse 24, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a, more, into a cultivated olive tree... How much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Beware that you can fall yourself. Beware that you can fall yourself. As 1 Corinthians tells us, quoting the, the uh, Proverbs, Let him that think if he standeth take heed lest he fall. It is possible to be lost once you've been saved. I know that goes contrary to what some folks have been told. But Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Ye are fallen away from grace. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Paul essentially concludes his discussion here in Romans. He's talking about the Jews and Gentiles and the old law and the new law of faith. In more theoretical terms. But in Galatia. Paul has brought these people to Christ. He's the one who brought the gospel there. And they have had individuals coming in. Saying they had to be circumcised. And Paul will not mince words. He concludes his book there. As he concludes this one. Worry that you don't fall away yourself. Into the Galatians he says. You have become estranged from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you are fallen away from grace. It's possible. Second Peter tells us about those who, like the dog, goes back to his vomit, like the sow who's been washed goes back to wallowing in the mire. Peter says it's worse for those who fall away than if they never heard the truth. Don't get me wrong. You have security in Christ. No one can take you out of his hand. It's not hard to live the Christian life. You're never going to be perfect with it. But with God's grace and his forgiveness, we walk in the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, that, there's a big problem folks have. They don't have fellowship with one another. They want to walk the life all by themselves. Now, I'm walking in the light. I'm doing fine. I'm living my way. I pray. I go to the mountains. I talk communion with God. Church. Fellowship with all those folks. They're a bunch of hypocrites. No, no, no. If I walk in the light, I have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses me, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You have security in Christ. I believe wholeheartedly in a biblical understanding of the security of the saints. The once saved, always saved, is a perversion that forgets this chapter. Don't be arrogant against those who got cut off. You could be cut off too. We've got to be ready to understand the message of this chapter. And it is clearly, don't get arrogant against the Jews. Beware in part for yourself. Be thou faithful unto death. And I'll give you the crown of life, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Jesus gave us the same message with the same figure of speech in John chapter 15. I am the vine, 
and ye are the branches. Abide in me that you may bear much fruit. And he makes the warning that the Father cuts off unproductive branches. Just as John the Baptist had preached, the axe is already laid at the foot of the tree. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10. Conclusion number one. Got our three points. Conclusion number one. Don't take it too far. Or else I'm contradicting myself. I'm not. God's calling and his gifts are irrevocable. God told Abraham, I'm making you my chosen man. I'm gonna, your seed is going to bless the world. We're promised that they're eternally going to be blessed. They are. All they have to do is come home. God never quit that calling. Any Jew could come home and now all Jews can come to Christ. The gift is still there. They're still blessed. The place of the blessing has somewhat changed. We are now all Israel. As Paul has previously stated in this book. Paul said, Peter said, excuse me, repent ye and be baptized every one of you. Chapter, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Every single person has the call to the gospel. But not everyone listens. Not everyone obeys it. But the call's out there, and he's, God's not taking it back. It's irrevocable. God has given his son's precious blood. He's not going to have a recall. He's not taking it away. God still has the invitation always open for us. For the message of this book is, God is much bigger than than you think he is. The depths and the riches, both of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. His ways past finding out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor, who is first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. <clears throat> to whom be glory forever. Amen. It's a mind-blowing book. God loved me enough to die for me. And all he asks for me to do is believe. Just believe. You have to hear to believe. You have to know what to believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Of course, believe it. In faith. You're going to make the good confession with the heart man believeth in the righteousness for the mouth confession is made to salvation. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Of course you're going to be baptized. But Jesus died on the cross for you. And his ability to forgive is better than yours. I know you're having trouble forgiving yourself for that thing. Maybe that thing you're still in trouble with. You're trying to overcome all on your own. You need God's help with. Don't put God in the box. The unsearchable riches of God are available to you. Why don't you use them? Why don't you use them? This morning, if you need to be baptized in Christ Jesus, don't put God in the box. Come on. Let Him do what He can do. Let Him help you overcome that. Let Him forgive you, whether you've forgiven yourself or not. How are you going to begin to forgive yourself unless you begin to obey Christ and come to Him in faith Amen. and believe in Him? Or if you're a Christian, won't you turn it all over to Him? We're going to start into the practical part of the book shortly. But believe me, the Christian life is the best way to live. And you're going to need God's forgiveness every day. Maybe 
You've gone to the point that you'd like to have somebody else pray for you. That's what the elders are going to be walking about for. Our shepherds are going to be coming by. Grab one of them. Pray with one of them. If you need to come home, let us know. If you need to come forward, please do so as we stand and sing to encourage you. Will you come? There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? issues such as with ear issues like infection and fluid causing her to have trouble hearing. Very disturbing to her active lifestyle. They have an appointment with a surgeon at the end of July. So be sure to remember that. Ronnie, are you our elder of the day? Please keep her in prayer. Let's go ahead right now and have our prayer and remember Nell and John and all the others of our family here at West Freeway. Most Holy Father, thank you for the time that we can be together this morning. But right now we want to thank you for this moment that we can pray. Let these individuals that have been announced, let their requests be made known to you. For our sister Nell Moore, and Desdemona, Kate's mother, ask my Father that you bless her and the ongoing problems she's uh, being affected by. Just continue to comfort her, strengthen her, give her what she needs at this time. Pray, Father, that you will give her comfort uh, as she continues to enjoy her life. Continue to bless her and thank you for what she has meant to us uh, in this community. Also, for our brother John, continue to bless his health problems. Continue to bless his loved ones there at the home. Continue to bless these young men that come with him every Sunday. Thank you so much for what they mean to us. Continue to give them the, what they need as well. This morning we want to pray for, as well, Sister Nelda Dukes, who will be having a hip replacement surgery tomorrow. Also, Father, she's having some ongoing heart issues that she'll deal with later. Father, just continue to bless Nelda and Johnny and Give them the comfort and strength that they need. Also for Ricky Wilson, so grateful, Father, for his recent uh, surgery that went well for his melanoma, that the biopsies came back clear of cancer. And, Father, we just continue to bless him, ask for your strength uh, in the coming days. Also, Father, we want to pray for these family members of West Freeway, Brother Tom Kane, Marie Clark, C.R. and Margaret Hamilton. Also continue to bless... Lee and Cindy Hines, for Sister Geneva McCoy, Deanna Morton, also for Reba Myers and Brother Frank Pixie, continue to
to give them comfort and strength, Father. For Stephen Smith, he continues to battle health issues. Continue to help him. Uh, Sister Dolores Thatch, uh, Brother Alan Teal, and also for Bruce and Renee Woodworth. Also, Father, for Corbin Potts, who is having some esophagus uh, issues. Continue to bless him and give him strength. For uh, Carol Garza, uh, the sister of Judy Barrett, and also for Anna Merced, a friend and co-worker of Les Sweet. Uh, Anna is battling breast cancer right now and is expected to undergo surgery soon. Father, hear our request that you bless each and every one of these family members. And again, Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. And thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and all the wonderful blessings that you share upon us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Real quickly, we want to thank each and every one of you who were part of our Vacation Bible School this past week. What a wonderful time for our family here. What a wonderful time for our children. And we do have on the welcome table uh, a sheet that you can fill out with suggestions on how we prepare for our VBS in 2025. So please take opportunity of that. But again, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, we want to remind you our summer series resumes this Wednesday night. Brother Robert Dotson from the Northwest Congregation in Lake Worth will be here. And he will be talking about uh, another lesson in our series, Finding God in Small Places. Where he'll be talking about the Philippian jailer. So we look forward to that. And we look forward to seeing you this afternoon, 1.30 for singing in our 2 o'clock small group studies. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. You're dismissed.